not on. There we go. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I've been drafted into service tonight. Our announcement guy is not able to be here. So we want to uh, welcome you. We're thankful for your presence here. Um, look forward to a, a good evening uh, together. Look forward to our classes. Um, we have uh, quite a few announcements that we want to uh, get run through before Barrett leads us in a few songs. Uh, we have some on our prayer request list that we need to make sure we're always remembering to uh, think of each week. Shirlene Walkingstick was released from the hospital on Monday. The family is requesting there be no visitors at this time. Autumn Mason, Brooke's sister, remains in the hospital. She's uh, improving slowly but steadily, which is good news. Uh, Dale Trout, Lisa Walkingstick's dad, had an emergency gallbladder surgery uh, today at Muskogee VA. He will get to go home tomorrow. Uh, Ken Myers is in room 2270. Is that still the case or did he get moved? 2241, but the same, it's like just up the hallway, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, but same area. Same area. Um, doing better. Is he still going to be moved to the nursing facility soon? Okay. Okay, you'll let, it, you'll let us know. All right. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, Dan Rouse's doctor reports radiation is doing well. In fact, has shrunk by 30%. It's amazing. Really good news. Uh, it's good to see good to see Dan and Carol. Uh, so grateful to hear that. Katie Russell is recovering well from surgery. Uh, Charlie Jones, the half brother of Chuck, is in need of our prayers as he struggles with his battle with cancer. And then Linda Quinn, a family friend of the Geists, is facing cancer surgery. Uh, this Saturday, we have a lot of things that are happening here at the building. Uh, first, there is a men's breakfast at 8 a.m., uh, but then afterwards, there is a community-wide event, an Easter egg dash. Um, always a, a good time uh, to be a part of these, and I know I've heard really good things about the one that we have here. So that'll be at 10, uh, lasting until 1. Uh, if you would like to help set up, uh, I believe that they're asking to come at 9 uh, to begin helping set up for that, uh, hiding eggs, those sorts of things. Uh, invite your friends, invite your neighbors. Um, there's going to be all kinds of activities. Uh, should be a lot of fun. Uh, there is a uh, sign-up sheet at the welcome booth. If there's any of the ways that you would like to volunteer, uh, we could really use your help. So we're excited about this opportunity to serve not only our church family here, but also the community here in Fort Gibson. So it should be a, a really good event. March 31st is Easter. We are concluding our series on the Psalms uh, with Psalm 34. I would encourage you to read that Psalm ahead of this weekend. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Uh, and indeed, we have good news to share. So we are looking forward to uh, Sunday morning as we always do. Quite of other events that we have coming up, make sure you grab a bulletin so you're aware of all these things that are happening. Janet, of course, does a wonderful job making sure we're informed of things that are going on. Soul Sisters are going to meet this week. Um, voting on April 2nd will be held here in the foyer. Uh, the first Wednesday month uh, fellowship meal will be catered by Ray and Dot on April 3rd, beginning at 5. April 3rd, there's going to be a, also on Wednesday a VBS and camp meeting in the youth room at 6.15. And then April 7th, uh, nursing home worship at 4 p.m. The Soul Sisters are hosting a taco fiesta for all new members of the congregation. Invitations should have been out in the mail if you're a, a, new, uh, a new member. Special guests, the ministers, elders, and their families. So we encourage you, if you're a new member and you've got an invitation, please make plans to come Monday, April 8th, beginning at 6.30. And of course, make sure you wish happy birthday to all of those who have had birthdays recently and today, uh, Cohen, Gary, Bailey, and Allie. Uh, with that, we are going to turn it over to Barrett before we end with the prayer. Okay, um, Justin mentioned Psalm 34 on Sunday, so uh, we know this song. It's called Psalm 34, uh, parentheses, Taste and See. And so we're going to review the uh, bridge of this song, which is what's up there right now. It's probably the most awkward part of the song, but it, it's uh, beautiful words, and it's, it's like uh, the very first thing that you read when you look at uh, Psalm 34. So we're going to actually uh, uh, re-add this back into the song, uh, and, and we've learned this in, in past uh, years. It's just the last several times we've sung it, we have not sung the bridge, so I wanted to make sure... Um, that we have this down really good and this can kind of be our core group 
that Sunday morning, we're gonna really belt it out on, on, this, on this bridge, okay? <clears throat> okay, so if you're an alto, <clears throat> and I know we have the alto and the soprano part up there, um, and so if you're an alto, follow the second line uh, down there, and um, then we'll, we'll review that, and then we'll go, go on and uh, review the soprano part and so forth, and then we'll go ahead and sing the whole song. <clears throat> no. Nope. Okay, altos, here's your pitch. Go with me. Let us bless the Lord every day and night, never ending praise. May our incense rise. Okay, so we'll go back again. There's a couple of different versions of this. Um, this is one of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let us bless the Lord every day and night. Never ending praise. May our incense rise. Okay, get ready to do it by yourselves. Three, one, two, three. Tenor. 
Oh 
I think we're ready for Sunday morning. It's going to be a happy Easter. All right. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful to be here, to sing songs to you, to be surrounded by our brothers and sisters, to be an encouragement to one another. We pray that our, our praise is uplifting and glorifying to you. We're thankful for the time that we have to open your word together, to study from it. We pray for all of those who uh, are in need of a helping hand, that we might be your hands and your feet to lend that to them, to put arms around shoulders, to bow heads together, and to lift up and to bind those who need it. We pray uh, for your wisdom, for your grace, and your mercy. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Yeah, sorry. All the men were worried when they're going back. Just give you the whole. The whole man.
All right, tonight we're going to pick up in Amos chapter 2, starting in verse 4. And uh, you remember from the previous lesson, before uh, we had the break, um, Amos went country by country, all the nations surrounding Israel. And you know, like we, we mentioned, that, that, that kind of got across the point that I, I'm one of you. And the people you don't like are my enemies as well. And they would have been cheering and amening and, or whatever it was they did back then for everything he had to say. Well, it's going to get, from their perspective, it's going to get even better this week because he starts off with Judah. Now, you remember, you know, originally he had the United Kingdom of Saul, David, and Solomon. And then after Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam throws the kingdom away through his own arrogance. And it divides into two, the northern part of Israel, the southern part of Judah. They were the same people, right? They were all descendants of Abraham. But they did not get along all that well. There was at least one occasion where they actually fought a war with each other. And most of the time, if one of them had an enemy, the other side didn't, didn't do anything to help them out. So it's, it's not like there was a constant war going on, but boy, there was a rivalry. You know, you, any of y'all raised two boys? We did. You know what I'm talking about then, right? I mean, they're brothers, and, but sometimes, boy, you'd never know it, right? We have two grandsons. Sometimes they get along really well, and sometimes it's like, okay, you go to that side of the house, and you go to that side of the house, you know, or, or one of you go outside while the other one stays in something. You gotta, just got to separate. Well, that, that's kind of how Israel and Judah got along. There was a lot of tension there. So let's look to see what Mo, uh, Amos has to say to Judah. Now, he starts off with a for three and for four. Like we mentioned before, that was a figure of speech that they all would have related to. So it's another little thing that Amos uses to say, I'm kind of one of you. And forgive me just a moment. I brought the water bottle, but I didn't bring it up front with me. For three and for four. And like he's done with the, with the pagan nations, even though we know there are at least four things he could have criticized Judah for, he really kind of only mentions a couple. All right, he charges them. Now, the nations were, were, were charged with what one author called outrageously inhumane conduct. I called it war crimes, that, that sort of thing. What's the nature of the charge against Judah? What has he got against them? Idolatry, okay. Now hold on to that. We'll come back to it. What's the first thing he charges him for? Not keeping the law, right? You see how this is a different category of offense? The nations are held to the standard of what everybody knows is right and wrong. The Ammonites ripped open pregnant women in order to expand their territories. I mean, who does that? Who does that kind of thing? Everybody knows that's wrong. The Jew, the, 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 the Judah, though, is charged with not keeping the law of the Lord. They've not kept his statutes. Okay? Specifically, Judah didn't keep the Torah. Now, that's the word that we sometimes use for the first five books of the Old Testament. But it also means the law or the teaching or the instruction. It's actually a little bit broader than just law. It's, it's a more general term. So bottom line is they did not follow the word of the Lord. Because when I say word of the Lord, that kind of encompasses everything, doesn't it? Okay, they didn't keep the word of the Lord. Now, the other, was, is the, the other that they didn't keep is the kukim. And that's the one that's translated statutes or maybe commandments or decrees. These are specific things that God has said, and they make up part of the Torah. Okay? So they didn't, so just in general, they weren't doing what the Lord said. More specifically, they weren't obeying the commandments the Lord had gave them. You know, so it's kind of comprehensive there, you know. If there was a way for them to, to, to mess up, they seem to have, to have found a way to do it. And notice this, they're not immune to judgment because they're God's people. Now, you remember we talked before about Israel having made God a national God, and it's almost like God belonged to them instead of the other way around? Well, you know, the Jew, down in Judah, they seem to have been leaning kind of a little bit the same way. They couldn't believe that God would hold them to account because he chose them. 
And He's supposed to bless them. We're His people. You kind of see that in the New Testament, don't you? Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, where, where Jesus says, Don't tell me you're children of Abraham. God can raise up children of Abraham out of these rocks if He wants to. Just being children of Abraham doesn't make you special, and yet the Jews thought they were special because God chose them. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, God tells them that I didn't choose you because you were more numerous, which is kind of shorthand for saying because you were great. I chose you because I loved you. See, the choice of, 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 the choice of Israel in the broad sense, the choice of Israel had nothing to do with who, Jew, who Israel was. It had everything to do with who God was. And it didn't make them special, but they thought they were. You know, the truth is, they weren't immune to judgment because of the covenant. They were actually subject to, to greater judgment because of the covenant. Only a child of Abraham could be accused of not keeping the law. Did, he didn't hold the Philistines to the law, did he? They weren't given it. They were held to the standard of what do decent people know to do. But the Jews, or the Israelites, were held to the standard of the law because God had given them the law. Now, that doesn't just apply to Judah. It's going to apply to Israel, too. And you'll kind of see that thought recurring throughout Amos. And then more specifically, as you mentioned, um, Judah is charged with idolatry. When he says their lies have led them astray, it's a word that sort of implies emptiness, vanity, vain, just there's no there there. Well, isn't an idol the ultimate example of that? When you look at, uh, I think I, I typed these references in for you, but in Jeremiah chapter 10 refers to the idols being empty. And same idea in, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 17. Isaiah chapter 44 is the famous passage where Isaiah talks about a fellow that cuts a tree down, uses part of the tree to bake, bake his bread, part of the tree to, to uh, heat his home, and the rest of it he carves into an idol and bows down and says, oh, oh and worships his God. And it's, 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 it's heavy, it just drips with sarcasm. You know, and it shows the, the, the total emptiness of idolatry. How in the world could you bow down to something that you made yourself, that you burnt part of it up to make bread? It just, it just doesn't make sense, does it? And yet that's what they were doing. So. They are accused of idolatry. And then it's the same sin after which their fathers walked. Literally, he says that they walked after the same lies that their fathers walked after. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 18, Elijah talks about, it's usually translated that, that the, the Israelites went after, but it literally says they walked after. Walking after means to follow, to commit yourself to. And they have walked after these idols. And, you know, if, when you look in the Old Testament, idolatry is the sin of the Israelites. You know, they, they had barely gotten out of Egypt and were at Mount Sinai, and Moses is up on the mountain receiving the tablets written with the hand of God. And what are the Israelites doing? Making and worshiping a golden calf. I mean, it, it didn't take them hardly any time at all, and they began to replace God with an idol. And then you go through the book of Judges. What did they do time after time after time? You know, they, they, weren't, they didn't get in trouble because they allied themselves with foreigners. They got in trouble because they worshipped idols. And so they were punished by the foreigners that God allowed to conquer them periodically. And time after time after time after time, idolatry is the problem. When you look at the history of the, of the divided kingdom, well, back up a little bit. It really gets to start with Solomon. Because Solomon, what do you, 600 wives? 700 wives. 700 wives. And it seems like every one of them, he allowed her to build a temple to her God in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. And Solomon's wise enough, he should have known better. And yet he's, 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 he's letting the worship of, of idols be established in Jerusalem. So it's not really not any wonder that when Jeroboam broke off and, and established the northern kingdom, that he sets up idolatry there. Solomon's already paved the way. And the history of the northern kingdom is the history of idolatry. It wasn't a matter of, of did they worship idols, it was which one. Because there were a bunch of them before the, the country was conquered. When you look at the southern kingdom, 
every one of those kings is judged on whether or not, the phrase is, remove the high places. The high places is where they would go to worship the Baals, the kind of the indigenous god of the Canaanites. And for some reason, Baal was powerfully attracted to the Israelites. And so the southern kingdom, all those kings are judged by, did they do anything about the high places? Idolatry was the sin of the, of the, uh, of the Israelites. And, you know, it wasn't until after the northern kingdom fell, the southern kingdom fell, they went to exile. It wasn't until after they came back from exile that they finally got over their attraction to idols. It took that much suffering and that much pain to have their country destroyed and have them stay 70 years in exile in Babylon before they could come home and rebuild. It took all of that before they finally stopped being drawn to idols. When you get to the New Testament, the Jews are so opposed to idols that it's become something that makes them superior to the, to the Gentiles because the Gentiles all worship idols and they're quite proud of the fact that they don't. Well, <laughs> if, if they don't, it's because they, they, finally, they finally learned the lesson. They don't really have that much to brag about. Anyway, now as, as Amos is making this charge against Judah, I have a feeling that uh, it, the, his listeners are experiencing what the Germans call schadenfreude. You know, have you ever heard that word before? It's actually crept its way into the English language. Schadenfreude. Okay, Germans have a lot of unique words for things. Schadenfreude is the joy you feel when someone else suffers. So, you know, if there's somebody you don't like and they get in trouble at school, did that kind of give you a little bit of a thrill? That's schadenfreude. Well, here Amos is getting after the southern, ki the southern kingdom big time. And he's preaching in the northern kingdom. And remember what I said about the sibling rivalry. What's one brother going to think when dad's getting after the other brother? Sort of enjoys it a little bit. So they, 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 are, they, are, they are primed and ready for Amos now to begin talking to them. The rest of the chapter is the charge against the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, what's the first thing you notice about the charge against Israel? See how long it is? It's almost the entire second chapter when he did five or six nations together in the first chapter. And remember, he's using this for three, and for, uh, for three and for four, using that figure of speech, but he only mentions one. With Israel, he mentions all, all he actually mentions seven charges. Four forms of oppression and three forms of religious, uh, uh, religious um, corruption. So he, he really, really goes after them. So let's look at what he has to say. For three transgressions of Israel and for four, this is verse six, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Now this appears to be two different things going on here. Selling the righteous for silver appears to be that it's, it's probably referring to corrupt courtrooms. It's either bribery or letting the wealthy have their way or something. But righteous people are being sold out even when they are in the right. They cannot win in the corrupt courts. This will come up again and again in Amos. The second one about um, selling the poor for, for, the, for a pair of sandals. In 2 Kings chapter 4, you may remember this story. Elisha met a widow. The prophet Elisha met a widow in 2 Kings 4. And... Her husband had left, you know, when, when the husband died and left a woman with two children, they would be destitute pretty quick because there was no way for her to earn a living. And if the children are small, there's no way for them to earn a living either. And so their debts would begin to pile up. And for this woman, her creditor is fixing to come and take possession of her boys and sell them into slavery to satisfy the debt. Debt slavery was a practice in Israel, okay? Debt slavery. And lest you think we're that much better, it wasn't all that long ago that it wasn't exactly slavery, but in England, they had debtors' prisons. And if you couldn't pay your debt, you'd be thrown into prison and forced to work. Might as well have been slavery. 
forced to work and you didn't get paid for it. It was just part of the sentence for not being able to pay your debts. But in Israel, they practiced debt slavery. So this woman, she's about to lose her boys, and she tells Elisha what's going on, and he asks her if she has any oil in the house, and she's got maybe half a jar. And he tells her to start pouring it out, and it, the miracle occurs, and she pours jar after jar after jar after jar after jar. She, she winds up having to run to all her neighbors to borrow jars from them, and they wind up with so much that she's able to sell it and pay off all her debts, and still have enough for her and the boys to live on. Well, here it doesn't work out so well. You've got people who have debts. Now, understand, we'll talk more about this in another lesson, but you know when God divided the land among the tribes, then each tribe would take their property and divide it among the clans in that tribe. Each clan would divide it among the families, and that land belonged to that family forever. And it was, it was sacred. You, you did not let that land go. And if you had to sell, you sold to a relative because the land had to stay in the family or, in, or at worst in the clan. Okay, well, what's happened in the, in the time of Amos, the wealthy have discovered that they could make a lot of money by exporting certain things that grew in Israel. And so they were taking over farms and pushing the small farmer off his land, or setting up a situation where he had to grow a certain product because they would make sure that nobody would buy anything else he grew. He had to grow a certain product and pay what they gave him for it. And you know what happens to the little guy when all of that's going on? He rapidly winds up in debt. So you've got people who've been forced into debt by the elite class. Okay, the wealthy and the government class, they've been forced into debt, and now they're being sold into slavery because of those debts. And in some cases, those debts amount to a pair of shoes. What can you buy a pair of shoes for? 50 bucks? Certainly at Walmart could. So imagine owing somebody the equivalent of 50 bucks and being sold into slavery because you can't pay that debt. That's what's happening to people. And if you protest in court about it, nobody will hear you. He also accuses them of what I would call an abuse of power. Look at verse 7. They trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted. Now understand that there are all kinds of laws in the Old Testament providing for the needs of the poor. For example, remember the story of Ruth? Remember how she got, how she collected grain to support herself and Naomi? It was called gleaning. You know, you were not allowed to go to the very corners of your field. You had to leave the corners of your field unharvested. And as you went along, you know, you're doing this all by hand, so what are the odds you drop something? Of course you will. If you dropped it, you couldn't pick it up. You had to leave it. And then the poor would come along, and they would harvest the corners, they would pick up what had been dropped. It was called gleaning, and it was a way for the poor to support themselves without having to go on public support. It's probably a better system than what we've got. And there are, that's just one example of things in the law that provided for the poor. Well, in this case, they're not, they're not only not providing for him, they're grinding their heads into the dust metaphorically. Anything that can be done to keep somebody oppressed, they're doing it. And then look at the next thing. A man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. We don't know if this is, uh, we don't know if this is some kind of sacred prostitution, which was practiced, prost sleeping with a prostitute as an act of worship to one of the gods, that was practiced. Or maybe it's a slave girl who, who simply can't say no. But either way, it's, it's an abuse of the person. She has no, it's abuse of the woman. She has no, agency in this, no ability to say no. And then look at the next, the next verse. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. I've noticed some verses for you in Exodus and Deuteronomy. Every one of those say, if you, if you take a garment, the outer cloak, as collateral, that's what it means as pledge. You take that as collateral. You can't keep it overnight. You want to know why? Or can you guess why? 
Daryl says, because the guy that owned it would freeze to death. That cloak doubled as a blanket. And you had to give it back to him overnight so that he wouldn't freeze to death. If it was a widow, you weren't allowed to accept it as collateral at all. And they're taking them, and look at what he says. They're laying down beside every altar. In other words, they're spending the night wrapped up in cloaks that they have taken as collateral. Now, I know I've said that the northern kingdom had turned basically a pagan nation, but you realize they were pretending to still worship the Lord God. When Jeroboam set up those golden calves, he told them, these are the gods who brought you out of Egypt. They were at least paying lip service to the worship of the Lord God, which means they should be paying lip service to the law of the Lord God. And here they are, flagrantly violating that law. So they're laying down beside the altars, probably altars to their pagan gods, wrapped up in cloaks that they kept overnight against the law. And in the house of their God, they're drinking wine of those they have fined. Either the wine was paid as a fine or they're using the fines to go buy, buy wine. But the wealthy are having drunken orgies in the temples of their gods, financed by what they've taken from the poor who have no alternative. There's no one looking out for the poor. Now, those are the four charges that I would classify as abuse of power. He then makes three charges that I would call corruption of religion. Verse 9 and 10, God basically says, they're doing all this in spite of all that I have done for them. The first way they're corrupting religion is they're ignoring God's blessings. Total ingratitude. They have no concept of, what, of how much God has given to them and, and the obligation that pl pl uh, places on them. They don't care. They're going to do whatever they want in spite of God. The next thing he mentions, um, look at verse 12, you made the Nazarites drink wine. Now you've, you've heard of a Nazarite vow? Samson was a Nazarite from birth, and, but most people weren't one from birth. You would take a vow for a specific period of time to devote yourself for a special purpose. But while you were fulfilling your Nazarite vow, you didn't cut your hair, you could not approach a dead body, and you didn't drink any alcohol. And it didn't just allow you to devote yourself to a special purpose. You also kind of served as a living witness to God among everybody that, that saw you fulfilling that vow. And what are they doing? They're, they're not allowing the Nazarites to bless them by their presence. They're forcing them to violate their vow. And then the third one is they're telling the prophets, just keep quiet. We don't want to hear from you. They're actually going to do that to Amos when we get to chapter 7. Tell him, the, the, the high priest tells him to shut up and go home. They don't want to hear from anybody speaking for God, and you can guess why, right? They know they aren't going to like the message. So they tell the prophets, just hush, be quiet. So because of all this, judgment is going to come. Verse 13 is hard to translate. It's either saying, I will press you down in your place as, a, as, a, as an overloaded cart presses down, or... The King James actually translates it that the Lord is pressed under the weight of carrying Israel. And I kind of wonder if that's not it. If God is saying, all that you've done, all of your sins have weighed me down to the point that I'm not going to carry it anymore, I'm going to shake it off. And when he shakes it off, what's going to happen? A lot of people think that some of what's going on here refers to the earthquake that's mentioned in chapter 1, verse 1. Amos spoke two years before the earthquake. So it's possible that he's hinting at the earthquake here in chapter 13. Then the rest of the verses, he, he describes how even the warriors will not escape when the day of judgment come. This is either a military disaster or a, a natural disaster that's so great that even the strongest and bravest and fastest won't be able to escape it. But whatever he's talking about, it's going to be so overwhelming that no one will get out. Now, one last thing before we move on. 
Remember what I said before about a national God. A national God gets to do two things. Fight for you in battle and bless you. That's it. And that's how they were conceiving of the Lord God. They made him their national God. Can you imagine how shocking it would be for them to hear Amos saying all these things in the name of their God? He's not only not blessing them, he's judging them and promising to destroy them. You you cannot overemphasize how unbelievable this would have sounded to his hearers. All right, real quick. I'm going to have to move, get through the rest of this. Why are Judah and Israel held to a higher standard than the nations around them? Luke 12, verse 48, to him who is given much, much will be demanded. They were given more. They knew more. They should have behaved different and better than the nations around them because they've been taught. The nations hadn't been taught. Now, this kind of leads to um, another question, you know, is God holding us to a higher standard? Well, Luke 12, 48 is actually in the New Testament, not the Old Testament, right? So I think Jesus was talking to us there as well. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself back toward the end of the outline. But Romans chapter 2, verses 12 and following, Paul just talks about Gentiles who are righteous because they do what's on their heart. They follow their conscience. You know, they do what everybody knows is the right thing to do. And they avoid what everybody knows is wrong. Okay, well, but how does he say we're judged? We're judged on the word of the Lord because we've received it. We, we, we claim to be Christians, right? We claim to follow the book, which means we, we're admitting we have the book and know the book. That's the standard we're held to. Somebody in deepest, darkest, whatever, who's never heard of Jesus won't be held to the same standard you and I are because he doesn't know. But you and I, we know. So we're going to be held to a higher standard just like Israel and Judah was. This idea of a covenant, you know, we have a covenant relationship with God. It doesn't just bind him to us. It binds us to him. And that brings responsibilities. We, we, we sometimes kind of act like Israel. We want all the blessings, but we don't want the obligations. You know, that's not how a covenant works. A covenant puts obligations on both sides. Yes, God has promised to look after us and bless us, but guess what? We have promised to obey. That's the nature of the covenant, obligations on both sides. Okay, why is idolatry so bad? Well, it... Okay, put something before God. Okay, it violates, definitely violates the first commandment and almost always the second commandment as well. Okay, about making a graven image. And it's, Daryl said you put something before God, that's true, but let me, let me take you a step further. You're putting something less than God in God's place. Folks, that's dangerous. You become like what you worship. If you're worshiping the Lord God, You can't help but be elevated because of who he is. If you worship anything less than him, you will be degraded because of what that thing is, whatever whatever the thing happens to be. Have you ever noticed, look at Romans chapter 1, the last half of Romans chapter 1. Look at the way Paul describes the world. Understand that's a world that doesn't worship God. They've replaced the creator with created things, Paul says in Romans 1. That's a world of idolatry. And look at the depravity that Paul describes in Romans 1. That's what happens. Idolatry weakens and debases the national character. And for some reason, it always seems to wind up in sexual depravity. I don't know why that has to be the case, but it always seems to work out that way. Maybe it's because idolatry is so focused on the physical world And at least in ancient times, the physical world meant the fertility of crops and herds. 
and that's not too far from the fertility of human beings. But I, but I tell you, you look at the history of idolatry and sexual depravity always gets brought in. Now, why is abuse of power so bad? You know what word the Bible consistently uses to describe the leaders of God's people, both Old Testament and New Testament? Same word. Consistent in both the Old Testament and New Testament. You know what it is? Shepherd. The kings were expected to be shepherds. Psalm 78 talks about David being pleasing to God because he was a shepherd to God's people. Ezekiel chapter 34, Ezekiel just tears into the shepherds of Israel because they've been failing the flock, failing to lead and protect the flock. What do we call the leaders of a church in the New Testament? Elder sometimes, but shepherd is frequently used, isn't it? And Jesus says that a good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He wasn't exaggerating to make a point there. That was literally true. A shepherd might have to protect his flock from lions or from bears or from other marauders. And sometimes they'd get hurt, sometimes they'd even get killed. But they were expected to protect the flock at all cost. Well, in this case, the leaders are not only not protecting the flock, they're abusing the flock. They're failing as shepherds, and God expects leaders to protect the people who've been entrusted to them. Even more, God loves the powerless. I, 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 God loves everybody, I know. But it seems like God especially loves the powerless. Look at the Sermon on the Mount. The poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, that's not the people wielding power, is it? And yet they're the ones that are called blessed. In both the Old and New Testament, women were the definition of powerless. Okay, both the Old and New Testament is pretty much patriarchal society. That's just the way culture was then, okay? But just as an example, in Jewish courts, a woman could not give testimony unless her testimony was backed up by that of a man. Women were powerless. And who was Jesus constantly reaching out to? He saw the widow of Nain, who just lost her son, leaving her alone in this world. What did he do? Brought her son back to life. He, the uh, Syrophoenician woman came up and begged him to do something about the demon possessing her, her, um, her little girl. And Jesus said, I can't do that. I was sent to the, to the Jews. And she said, I would gladly, I would gladly take the scraps that they dropped from the table. And he praised her faith and healed her daughter. Or look at the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus shouldn't have even been talking to her. Because she was not, not just because he was a man and she was a woman, she was a Samaritan. And not only does he talk to her, he's gentle with her, he's kind to her. He may have been the first man in her life, you look at her history, may have been the first man in her life to have been kind to her. And he's constantly going out of his way to reach out to people who were powerless. And in Israel, they're going out of their way to abuse those who are powerless. All right, next week we'll get into chapter 3. Um, Go home and think a little bit about the questions we didn't get to at the end. Okay, just for what it's worth, the one about does abuse of power still exist in our country? I would argue that not only is the answer yes, it's the very same ones that Amos talks about. The very same ones. All right, thank you for your attention. See you next week.